Hi everybody, it's Professor Mitchell. So we're going to start chapter two today, and we're actually going to start in section 2.2, which is displaying quantitative data. So remember the types of data that we talked about in chapter one. There's qualitative data, right? Data that, um, usually described using words or categories. And we'll be talking about uh, how to display that kind of data in the next section. In this section, we're going to talk about displaying quantitative data. So the first uh, option you have for displaying quantitative data is a frequency distribution. A frequency distribution shows the number of data observations that fall into specific intervals. Uh, and the advantages of this type of display is it graphically summarizes information not readily observable by merely looking at data in a table. Uh, so some of the vocabulary that we'll be using in this uh, for this type of display, uh, we'll be talking about classes. A class is a category which will take up a row in a frequency distribution. So uh, here's a pretty simple example. Let's say that we were looking at, say, an Apple store uh, and looking at the number of iPads sold per day. So here you have all the raw data, all right? And uh, if you were trying to get some sense of how many iPads are sold in a typical day, uh, it wouldn't be very easy to do from this. So all you do is, uh, since the number is always between zero and five, we can just make each of those numbers be its own category and then count how many times each of those numbers appears in the data. So for example, uh, the zeros are circled, so there are five of those. Uh, next, you could go ahead and count the ones. It turns out there are eight of them, et cetera, et cetera. After you form this frequency distribution, you should add up your frequencies and make sure that they match uh, the number of data values that you know you have in your original set of data. So that number is 50, that checks out. All right, so now let's talk about discrete versus continuous data. Discrete data, are values based on observations that can be counted and are typically represented by whole numbers. So the way that I like to distinguish between discrete and continuous data, discrete data usually answers the question, how many, all right? So it represents something that has been counted and it takes on whole numbers such as zero, one, two, three. On the other hand, continuous data are values that can take on any real numbers, including numbers that contain decimal points. And uh, continuous data tends to answer the question, how much, instead of how many. Uh, continuous data are usually based on measurements rather than on counting. So some examples of continuous data would be things like weight, time and distance, anything that can be measured uh, as a decimal or a fraction. All right, uh, here are some examples. Discrete data, number of children per family, number of cars listed per insurance policy, or vacation days per month. So those are all things that are counted. Examples of continuous data might be uh, the time required to read chapter two. Okay, that number could be a decimal. The thickness of paint applied to a car body or the voltage of batteries produced in August. Okay, these are how many questions. These are how much questions. All right, relative frequency distributions display the proportion of observations of each class relative to the total number of observations. So instead of showing the count, it shows the proportion. So this proportion is always going to be a number, a, a, a decimal number between zero and one, uh, or it could be a fraction. So it shows the fraction of observations in each class 
which could be written as a fraction or a decimal. Uh, that relative number is found by dividing each frequency by the total number of observations. And we have an example coming right up. The fractions or decimals in a relative frequency distribution add up to 1, 1 1.00. So here we've taken our frequency distribution for the number of iPads sold per day and we've added a relative frequency column. So remember there were uh, a total of 50 days. On five of those days, zero iPads were sold. Five divided by 50 comes out to 0 0.10. On eight of those days, one iPad was sold. Eight divided by 50 is 0.16, and so on and so on. Notice that these numbers add up to one. And so now you can say something like two iPads were sold on 28% of the days. The advantage of uh, a relative frequency, let's say that on one occasion, I uh, looked over the past 50 days and then somebody else looked over the past 200 days. The actual frequencies would be more difficult to compare, all right, because if you're looking at 200 days, uh, all of these numbers would be higher. But if you change everything into relative frequencies, uh, then you can compare them. Then you have what's called a cumulative relative frequency distribution. And the way that works is it totals the proportion of observations that are less than or equal to the class at which you're looking. It shows the accumulated proportion as values vary from low to high. And just like anything else, this will make a lot more sense when we look at an example. So here is that same frequency distribution. You have the number of iPads sold per day. You have the, the actual frequency, the relative frequency. And then you have the cumulative relative frequency. So the way this works, follow my mouse pointer here. What these numbers represent, the 0 0.1, the 0 0.26, 0 0.54, that is the proportion of days in which that number of iPads was sold or less. That number or less was sold. All right, so the first row is always just going to be the same as the relative frequency. And then to get the numbers below that, you can go like this. You just say 0 0.1 plus 0.2. 1, 6, see where I'm looking here, uh, adds up to 0.26. So what that means is that on 26% of the days, one or fewer iPads was sold. Okay. Then we take the 0.26 and add 0.28, and that gives you uh, 0.54. So on 54% of the days, two or fewer iPads were sold. Uh, and so on and so on. So 0 0.54 plus 0.26 is 0.8, and they explain here what that means. Three iPads or, that should say fewer, there is a difference, all right, uh, were sold on 80% of the days, okay? The last number in a cumulative relative frequency should always be one. And what that means is that on 100% of the days, five or fewer iPads were sold. We know that that number is never bigger than five. All right, then you can use a histogram to graph a frequency distribution. A histogram is a graph showing the number of observations in each class of a frequency distribution. The difference between a histogram and a frequency distribution is a histogram is a picture, all right? A frequency distribution is just a table. Uh, they mention here about Excel. Now, there will be, I love Excel, all right? So there will be times, mostly later in the semester, where I will show you how to do things on Excel. Unfortunately, uh, making histograms on Excel is surprisingly complicated. All right, um, so I'm going to skip over that right now. I actually wrestled with that a little bit. I think it was last year. 
I was trying to figure out how to make a histogram in Excel and I found out you had to install uh, some kind of extent, I forget the word for it, but uh, you know, some kind of uh, extra thing you had to install with Excel and my computer didn't want to install it and eventually I gave up, all right? <laughs> um, okay, so uh, that brings us to the shape of histograms. By the way, uh, what you're looking at here are examples of histograms, okay? So uh, they don't come right out on here and explain uh, what these graphs represent. I, I'm going to take an educated guess and say that these histograms probably represent uh, that students got on an exam, all right? That seems like a uh, reasonable guess. So in the nine o'clock class, uh, everybody got between, certain, I'm going to say 77.5 and 90%. Uh, and notice this graph is symmetric, all right? So the same number of students got uh, C pluses as B pluses, and the same number of students got B minuses as B pluses, and the most common grade was just a regular old B, okay? Uh, in the 10 o'clock class, it's still symmetric, but has a wider spread, all right? So I'm going to give you a term to just kind of put on the back burner until we get to, I'm pretty sure this is going to come up in chapter three. The standard deviation is a measure of how spread out uh, a set of data is. This set of data has a larger standard deviation than this one does, okay? So whereas in the nine o'clock class, everybody got between 77.5 and 90, in the 10 o'clock class, everybody got between 70 and 95, okay? Now notice it's not perfectly symmetric. Um, you know, most real life histograms are not perfectly symmetric, uh, but it's pretty close, okay? So, uh, this one here though, it looks like the uh, 11 o'clock class might have struggled a little bit. We had a lot more students getting C minuses than uh, Bs even. This type of histogram is what we call skewed to the right, all right? Um, yeah, skewed to the right. Uh, <laughs> I just got done this summer uh, teaching a statistics class. It's not exactly the same one that you're taking now. Uh, but I was reading the discussion posts, uh, you know, that my students made. And one of them uh, posted something really, uh, really neat that I had never heard before about skew, uh, the difference between skewed to the right and skewed to the left. I've always felt that the, um, that those terms are kind of uh, counterintuitive. So this one is skewed to the right, all right? Uh, the mirror image would be skewed to the left. So one of my students posted, uh, and they had read this actually, uh, that uh, a cute way of remembering which one is skewed to the right and which one is skewed to the left is to look at your toes, all right? If your toes were the bars of a histogram, then the toes on your right foot would be skewed to the right and the toes on your left foot would be skewed to the left, all right? Here's your big toe, there's your little toe, okay? And again, it's not perfect, but um, that's the idea. We will probably be talking more about skew later. I'm not 100% sure, but there it is. All right, constructing a frequency distribution using grouped quantitative data. So. Uh, in the example we were just looking at, those data were not grouped. They were just individual data values. However, especially when you're working with continuous data, uh, it's a really good idea to group the data together so that you're looking at a reasonable number of categories. So the first thing they say here is something that I've seen in another book. I've always thought it was kind of funny. Ideally, the number of classes in a frequency distribution should be between four and 20. Right? So that's a pretty big spread. Um, we'll say a little more about that in a minute. 
some data sets, again, particularly those with continuous data, require several values to be grouped together in a single class. This grouping prevents having too many classes in the frequency distribution, which can make it difficult to detect patterns. Now here's something I had never seen before uh, I saw your book. One method to determine the number of classes in a frequency distribution is to use this rule, two to the K should be greater than or equal to N. All right, where N is the number of data points. So for example, if N was 50, like in the example we were just looking at, uh, two to the fifth power is 32 which is not greater than or equal to 50. However, 64 is greater than or equal to 50. So what it's saying is that if you have 50 data points, you should have at least six classes. All right, once it's known, then the width of each class can be found. The width is the range of numbers to put into each class. So your first step in figuring out what that width uh, is or should be, all right, you actually get to pick the width. But the first step is to calculate the estimated class width where you do the maximum data value minus the minimum data value and divide that number by K, which is the number of classes, all right? Now, most of the time, uh, that number will not be a whole number. So uh, what you do then is round that estimate to a useful whole number that makes the frequency distribution more readable. So if you're doing this in your real life, there is not, not just one way to do that, all right? You might pick a class width of seven and somebody else might pick a class width of nine, all right? Uh, so yeah, there it is. There is no one correct answer for the class width. The goal is to create a histogram to clearly and usefully show the pattern in the data. Often there is more than one acceptable way to accomplish this. So uh, in a class, just so your professor doesn't get driven crazy, uh, sometimes I will specify uh, what class width I want you to use and also uh, where should the first class begin. And if I tell you those two things, then everybody should come up with the same histogram and it's very easy for me to grade. All right, uh, then you have class boundaries. Minimum values for each class. And you should choose class boundaries that are easy to read. So in this example, that uh, they're saying they should be whole numbers, if at all possible. Uh, if you can't do whole numbers, then use decimals that end in 0.5. All right, that's the second best thing. Uh, but definitely don't do something like this, 3.21 to less than 6.21. That's kind of confusing. All right, so here's an example. Uh, frequency distribution for Dell's customer support hold times. So that uh, ranges from zero to 18 or maybe it ranges from zero to 17. So um, if you were to try to do a frequency distribution like the one we did for the number of iPads sold per day, it would have 18 rows and it wouldn't be very easy to read, all right? So a better option is to use classes. So the way they've set up these classes is zero to less than three. Remember the, um, these numbers might, some of them might be decimals. So that's why they're saying zero to less than three. There might be a 2.5 in there. And then three to less than six, six to less than nine, et cetera, et cetera. So if these are the frequencies, all right, we're not seeing the original data, uh, then you do your relative frequencies the same way, all right? Uh, again, there are 50 of these. 5 divided by 50 is 0.1, 18 divided by 50 is 0.36, et cetera, et cetera. And you can also do your cumulative relative frequency. Remember how that works, 0.1 plus 0.36 equals 0 0.46, 0 0.46 plus 0.18 is 
0.64 plus 0.22 is 0.86, et cetera, et cetera. All right, some rules for classes for group data. Number one, all classes in the frequency distribution must be of equal width. Notice in this last example, 0 to 3, 3 to 6, 6 to 9, 9 to 12. So the width of all these classes is 3. Number two, the classes must be mutually exclusive. They cannot overlap. So again, I'm going to go back here. Notice it says 0 to less than 3 and then 3 to less than 6. So if I had a hold time that was exactly 3 minutes, I know that that goes in the second class and not in the first one. Uh, include all of your data values. Make sure all data values are accounted for in the total row of the frequency, in the total row of the frequency distribution. Avoid empty classes if possible. Now, I don't feel as strongly about this, uh, maybe, as your book does. Uh, empty classes can actually be kind of uh, informative. If you're using a reasonable number of classes, it could be that some of your classes are empty, all right? Um, they're saying it's undesirable for a histogram to display a class so narrow that there are no observations in it. Well, I agree with that, uh, but sometimes the class is not all that narrow and it still just doesn't have any, uh, you know, da uh, data values in there. So let's say that I was making scores of my uh, statistics exams, and I could see something like this happening. Uh, let's say that my classes have width five. So I went 75 to less than 80, 80 to less than 85, 85 to less than 90. It could happen that there's nobody in the 90 to less than 95 row, but there are some people in the 95 to less than 100 row. Uh, yeah, or let's say class, all right? I would call it a row if I was doing a, a frequency distribution, okay? Or it, um, if I'm doing a histogram, I would call it a class. All right, so yeah, I would agree. Don't make your classes so small, you know, that you have a bunch of empty classes. But, you know, if you're using a reasonable number of classes, then you might have some that are empty. Okay, it's not a big deal. Avoid open ended classes if possible. So, an open ended class would be something like 75 or less on the exam. All right. Hopefully it happens that nobody gets less than a 70, all right? Um, you know, but I should still call that class 70 to less than 75. Okay. Constructing a histogram with grouped quantitative data. Uh, so they're talking about Excel here. Uh, some of this is, is, yeah, I think I'm going to skip over this and just get into, here we go. All right, um, so without talking too much about Excel, let me point out that the bars of a histogram should not have any spaces between them. Um, because going back to what we were talking about with empty classes, uh, you know, it looks, it, it's, it's hard to tell. Is this a, a gap or is it an empty class? the class from here to here uh, that has no data values in it. Right? So histogram bars are always stacked right next to each other, just like you see here. Okay. All right, the consequences of too few or too many classes. If you have too few classes, which means the classes are very wide, uh, Here's the kind of histogram you get. It's not very interesting. Uh, it, can, it can obscure important patterns. It gives a blocky distribution graph. You know, these just look like blocks. Uh, it summarizes the data way too much, and it tells us very little about the true distribution shape. On the other hand, 
If you have too many classes, which means the classes are very narrow, uh, then you could end up with a histogram that looks like this, very jagged. Uh, some classes may be empty for no good reason, right? Uh, and it doesn't summarize the data enough. So you wanna do something between this and this. All right. Uh, discrete or continuous data, yes. Now, sometimes there is kind of a, a gray area between discrete and continuous. Some data are technically discrete, but are displayed in a continuous format. So here are some examples. Age, you usually give your, your age as a whole number, right? Um, income is usually given as a whole number of dollars. Uh, other discrete data sets containing a wide range of values are treated as if they are continuous. All right, so we'll end this section by talking about the OGIV. The OGIV is a line graph that plots the cumulative relative frequency distribution. It provides a simple representation of the frequencies that are less than or equal to a certain number. So here uh, you can see the OGIV plotted over top of the histogram. And uh, let's see, I, okay. So notice that this dot lines up with uh, this one over here. So let's see if I can, uh, yeah. Uh, again, it, it really just, it's a way of, of graphing your cumulative frequency. Okay. Uh, cumulative frequency is, is not um, ever made into a histogram. Uh, and this slide just explains how to do an OGIV on Excel. And I'm going to skip over that because we're not doing uh, histograms on Excel. So that's actually going to take care of uh, section 2.2. And we'll see you next time.